Welcome to the intersection of city politics and everyday life. I'm Brian Lehrer. Five years ago this month, on October 29, 2012, the largest Atlantic storm ever recorded with a diameter of 1,100 miles hit New York City and the region, Superstorm Sandy. Coming at high tide and a full moon, the wind-driven waters rose 14 feet above normal, flooding the subways and Con Ed substations. An explosion on East 13th Street in Manhattan lit the night sky. Below 34th Street, mostly darkness. Swaths of the city had no power. Sandy destroyed thousands of homes and took the lives of 53 New Yorkers. In response, the outgoing Bloomberg administration began a multi-billion dollar recovery and rebuilding effort. It continues today as part of Mayor de Blasio's 1NYC city planning blueprint. But is the city rebuilding in a way that truly prepares us for the next Sandy? We'll get to that and address the ongoing emergency in Puerto Rico, which is still reeling from Hurricane Maria. Nearly a month after it struck, less than 20 percent of the island's electric grid is working. Where running water is available, it's unsafe to drink unless disinfected. We don't know the full death toll. We do know that the politics turned ugly after some presidential comments and tweets. All right, let's get to all this. In our studio, we've assembled a panel that knows storms, past, present, and future. Joining us, Herson Barrero, columnist for City and State and commentator for New York One and New York One Noticias. He is closely following developments in Puerto Rico. City Council Member Mark Traeger is here too. He chairs the Council's Recovery and Resiliency Committee and represents a district by the sea, the 47th, covering Coney Island, Gravesend, Seagate, and Bensonhurst. And Klaus Jacob joins us, a senior research scientist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. Dr. Jacob led a 2011 report famously predicting that a storm surge could disrupt the New York transit system. That prediction came in the year before Sandy. He's working on an updated version of that report now. Welcome, all of you. Welcome. And let's start by telling some stories. How's your neighborhood five years after Sandy? Is it ancient history? Hmm. Well, our people are resilient, and I'm very proud to represent a very strong uh, neighborhood made up of really great, resilient people. But we still have a lot more work to do. Uh, both in terms of housing, uh, both public housing, uh, private homeowners, uh, both in terms of our infrastructure. Uh, I represent, in my view, one of the coolest beaches that we have in New York, Coney Island Beach. But for tourists, it's a beautiful recreational area. But for our folks who live here, that's our infrastructure. That's our first line of defense. So uh, we uh, have made some progress since Hurricane Sandy, but we still have a lot more work to do, more families to return home, uh, making sure our hospitals get made more resilient, our, our, our uh, housing stock becomes more resilient. So Before uh, we even focus in right. on more resilient, Correct. meaning preparing for future storms, Correct. you said families to return to their homes still. There are still families displaced by Sandy? Correct. Uh, we, are, we are still experiencing families who have uh, moved out because their homes were damaged and they're in the Build It Back program. Uh, they've been told that hopefully construction will start at some point, uh, will get completed at some point. But yes, there are still families who are displaced. And what that means is that they are paying rent uh, at, at a different location and still paying a mortgage on that property. And some of them are one illness away, one injury away from literally going into financial ruin. So there must be a great sense of urgency to get this recovery done right and done right as soon as possible. Person, who are you talking to in Puerto Rico, and what's the latest that you're hearing that maybe the mass of viewers out there don't know? On a personal level, I just heard from my cousin of mine, uh, and she just communicated to me after 29 days. I originally spoke to her the day prior to the storm, Hurricane Maria hitting, and she lives in Ponce. Ponce is on the south part of the island. Um, you have, you know, people hear about San Juan and all the major cities, Bayamón and all Rio Piedras and what happens there. Where 75% of the usage of energy is, 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 is done and also almost 2 million people reside in the metropolitan area. But there is the rest of an island where a total of 78 towns. Lin Manuel did a whole thing on, you know, for benefit of dimensions every town. Lin Manuel Miranda who wrote Hamilton. Wrote Hamilton. So th th I can tell you that. You hear stories, horror stories, Brian, that 
you cannot fathom that would happen in 2017 with U.S. citizens, uh, part of this nation through, uh, you know, a territory, a possession, uh, where investments has been in the billions, in the billions that U.S. taxpayers have actually spent on the island of Puerto Rico and, you know, bringing it into a modern day age, uh, investments that were made by individuals, by corporations, that they would be treated this way by FEMA. It's horror stories. They're worse than what you've heard in the press. Uh, they're heartbreaking. There are deaths. The death toll, as you said at the beginning of the program, was still unknown. The cause and effect of those neglects or inability to have the proper medical care. I'll give you a personal example because every Puerto Rican, anywhere you see them in the United States, the diaspora, which has been very important to this process, they will tell you a story in my household right now. We're blessed to have my mother-in-law. She's 85, her sister's 83, and I have a 22-year-old. How is that story relevant? The 22-year-old is a college graduate, unable to write, you know, go and seek a job right now. There is no future for him there. He has to come to New York. He's in our home, my wife and mine. And then we have the 83-year-old um, aunt of my wife who is, actually needs cancer treatment. She was supposed to start it, you know, coming up in another two weeks. She has to now receive it in New York. We're making all the arrangements. My mother-in-law takes, she has like 30 different medicines she has. We're talking about critical care of people that are unable to defend themselves. Yeah. And, and, and what it does, Brian, the stories are not exaggerated. Puerto Ricans will have to find an option. They will have to cross that aerial bridge in order to survive or have a future for the island. Some of them will go back. Some of them probably will not survive this. We, it is an uncertain future. And I have gotta tell you that what is sensitive to us and we, because we have the bulk of the diaspora here in New York, is how Sandy in its horrible ways, the aftermath, the experience that the councilman is still living and, and your constituents, how that has helped to, at least I understand, and many of us, to, for New Yorkers to be extra sensitive. We're part of what the Mario Cuomo used to call the family of New York. And now we see Andrew Cuomo doing the right thing, which we're, you know, one of the few times that I'm really proud of things that the governor has done. And, and I say all of this because New Yorkers have been really, cr I mean, the, the f people that are there, volunteers, that are actually experts, that went through Sandy, that has mattered a lot, and it gives us hope. Great. Dr. Jacob, I could ask you a question, but I'm just wondering what you're thinking, listening to Herson as an expert in this field. Well, <clears throat> uh, often it is said that um, disasters amplify pre-existing stresses, okay? And they simply amplify conditions that are latent and so I think what we see here, that the relationship between Puerto Rico and the other 50 states still hasn't quite sorted out itself. And that shows right now in the response. I think you are the fifth wheel on the wagon or the 51st state that you aren't. And so uh, even so lip service is being provided down in Washington. I think Texas as an Alabama, Harvey, and other storm-stricken areas are a little bit better closer to the trough when it comes to disaster relief and planning. So is it your observation, being an expert, in disaster planning and relief uh, and hurricane resiliency in particular, is it your observation that the federal government's response to uh, Maria on Puerto Rico is less proportionally than it was in Florida and in Texas with the other storms because they're a 51st state and therefore culturally a little bit rung below? Well, that two facts that play together. The first is that Puerto Rico was hit harder in terms of the level of destruction than Texas or any of the other states that we recently have experienced, or for that matter, Sandy here. Okay. So, I mean, we had 
power outages here and in other places, but not practically entire nation, should I say? Yes. Oh, that would be appreciated. <laughs> Island nation. <laughs> Island nation. As a member of the independence movement. As, as, a, as a believer in nation. independence. <laughs> Island nation, I call it. Thank can, you. Can I ask you about one other particular piece um, of the uh, recovery on Puerto Rico that I'm kind of obsessed with? It's water. Uh, we hear about the electric grid over and over again in the mainstream media, and yet we also hear that there isn't drinkable water on much of the island. Mm -hmm. And then I think, people are going to die if they can't drink water. What's happening? A basic human need is not being satisfied right now, and you would think that in an island nation surrounded by water with plenty of air and sun, the solar energy would be there to be able to remedy this. Now what they're trying to do is get the grid up. Uh, we had on city and state, we had Gil Quinones from the New York Power Authority, who, who people haven't really listened to, explaining it from that sense. There's a relationship between the power grid and the drinkable water? The drinkable oh. water, yes. Yes, there is. And you, as a scientist, the scientist can explain it better. But Gil, in this podcast that we recorded with Nick Powell at City and State, he explained it. We asked him all kinds of questions. By the way, one of my questions was in a stupid manner. But since we got from, you know, who, that, that Puerto Rico is an island surrounded by water, so that, you know, it's ridiculous. But why then haven't we been able to have sustainability in a manner that doesn't depend on the traditional forms, which, by the way, Brian, so people understand, that's what's being fixed right now. So we're going back to the same thing that causes, but we look, and Gil made the point, alternatives have to be made. Councilman? Available. Are we ready in Bensonhurst, on Coney Island, the rest of your district, for a next Sandy? It's been five years. We talk so much about resiliency. The last mayor, the present mayor, talk a great game. Are we ready? I'm asked this question quite a bit. And, and my answer is that we're more studious, but we're not uh, better prepared at this time. Uh, there has been a number of studies uh, done or in the process of, of being completed. For example, when I took office, uh, there was a Jamaica Bay study that included parts of Queens and into Long Island, but excluded all of Southern Brooklyn. And as someone who represents Southern Brooklyn, I took issue with this. And we were able to get our neighborhoods included into the study. But then we're told that the Army Corps only has about $400 million when the study's implementation will cost over $4 billion. And they still have to complete the study by March of 2018. So uh, that's one study in the works. Then you have in Lower Manhattan the, the Big U project, which people talk about, which actually, if you look at what's funded, it's maybe just a part of a J, sure. not even a U. Uh, so they still need more resources. I've already reached out. Uh, to my Congress members, uh, both Hakeem Jeffries, Dan Donovan, uh, I've, I've spoken to Senator Schumer's office, that we need to find a way to get funding for these projects into an infrastructure bill or into some package in Congress. And the argument is, is that this should be a bipartisan issue. Whether you live in Texas, Florida, or New York, or Puerto Rico, we're in this together. And, and might I add a term that I now go by, that we're united as Americans, whether you live in Puerto Rico or in Coney Island or... Uh, we're also climate change refugees. Those folks who have been displaced by the storm, we're in this together. And so there is a great sense of urgency. And might I add one more piece to this conversation. As we speak right now, FEMA's in the process of redrawing flood, flood zone maps of, of New York. It might not be a big physical uh, hurricane that will hit us, but a financial storm will, because thousands and thousands of more New Yorkers will be, will be required to purchase flood insurance at some point soon, which will be very costly and hit most vulnerable families the most. So I'm very worried about that. Dr. Jacob, you did that study in 2011 that I mentioned in the introduction that predicted flooding could uh, be a real hazard to the New York City transit system. Then the next year, Sandy came, and obviously it was. We're still fixing the L train and things like that. Um, are we more prepared? And to the councilman's point just now, is does the map need to be redrawn because of global warming or whatever else you want to uh, attribute it to? So, there are two questions. Yes, sir. One is uh, the infrastructure, in particular the transportation system. Um, the MTA, and in particular the subdivision of the New York City Transit that runs the subways, the buses, and the Staten Island Railroad, uh, have identified a total of 
3,600 openings in the subway system wow. that need to be protected from being flooded. Openings, meaning where water can rush in. That can be subway entrances, ventilation shafts, or the sidewalk grids that you hear the subway rattling underneath. And all of these, in case of a recurrence of Sandy or any other such storm in the future, uh, need to be closed in order to um, make the subway system not being flooded again. The uh, New York City Transit is probably in halfway in having installed these uh, devices, there are 12 different designs, to ensure that this uh, will not flood again. But if Sandy would occur today, maybe the lowest lying uh, subway stations that were the first to be done Maybe okay, but then the ironically, ones, ironically, well, the lowest lying should be the most vulnerable. That's why they started with those. So th I think they did that right. <laughs> uh, that's but, also a lesson for Puerto Rico in terms of how long it takes to recover from this kind of thing for the long term. And if you would recover too quickly, the danger is you just would go back where you were before. The to the comfort level. The comfort level. And so it's better to go about it systematically, slowly, even so there's a risk in right. between. But in the long run, you are better off thinking about it and planning a little bit ahead for the future. Councilman. The professor is absolutely correct. Uh, when, when I took office, uh, I learned that FEMA uh, did not give our public housing uh, building, or NYCHA, uh, all the funds it needed to fix the damaged boilers and infrastructure and roofs. Um, and there seemed to be uh, some back and forth between the city and the federal government about, well, the, the city says, give us the money, we'll start making repairs. And FEMA was saying, well, we want designs on resilient boilers. We're not going to give you money to put them back in the basement, which, which will flood again in, in a matter of years. So when I took office and I learned that not one dime was exchanged between FEMA and the city, I said, listen, Let's be adults in the room and let's figure this out. And the city should draw up design plans uh, to make the boilers more resilient. But FEMA, you need to give them the resources. And finally, after our historic hearing in Coney Island in a public housing right. complex where we brought residents to testify first and they grilled city officials, then FEMA found the money. They found $3 billion to public housing. But they're going to build it more smart now because now the boilers will be elevated. Uh, and, and, and more, uh, more resilient structures, new roofs with backup generators in it. Uh, same goes for our hospital system as well. So you, the professor is right. You can't just build back to the old standards. You have to build to new resilient standards. But there was a, uh, a second part to, the, to your question that right. had to do with the FEMA flood zone maps. Right. Yes, yes. Uh, they were contested based on scientific errors that were made by the FEMA consultants. Correct. Uh, so the city is now... Uh, going uh, together with FEMA into a joint project to come up with the right maps. Correct. But it should be said, you know, 100-year flood maps, 1% per year per chance to be flooded, is an arbitrary number. No Sandy, no Maria, no other hurricane or storm cares what we put on maps. Hmm. That's a fictitious number, OK? Uh, it's a good guess, good scientific guess, but that doesn't mean that the next storm wouldn't be higher than but, that one percent chance. Per but year. you have to know where it's worth spending money to prepare. Well, here we go. Um, <laughs> what Congress passed five years ago was the Flood Insurance Affordability Act, and they patted themselves on the shoulder and said, Look, now we don't have those deficits in the National Flood Insurance Program, which right now is at $30 billion in the red. Yep. We will wipe out this deficit. Well, then they heard from their clients in Coney Island and anywhere else. Right. These are skyrocketing rocketing premiums sometimes 10 times as much as before. Correct. Mm. How can I pay 
that flood insurance and my mortgage at oh, the same right. time. Right. Hmm. So then Congress came and patted itself again on the back and revoked those increases and staggered them over a period of 10 years. So now they go up every year, roughly huh. 10 percent. Still so. gradually becoming unaffordable, exactly. which, ac which actually brings us back to Puerto Rico. And I want to put up on the screen that famous or infamous tweet from the president <laughs> about, hey, we can't keep the military there forever. We can't keep FEMA there forever. He seems to take every opportunity uh, to kind of Puerto Rican bait or Latino bait, because it relates to other things. If, if you want to call it that, I'll take the liberty of interpreting it that way. And, and Herson, to your eye, is it a matter of Trump is being Trump, but FEMA on the ground is doing a good job or not so much? Well, he was lying about the figures of FEMA people, which is offensive to the agency because then it gives the yes. appearance or expectation they're going to get the job done because they have 15,000 FEMA workers. They weren't. They were on 7,500. Not my numbers. I was interviewing Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, who's been a leading voice in the fight uh, to, re to repair Puerto Rico, get it back to Roma, among other people, right. good people in Congress. But what is troubling about that is that if, in fact, he had just done something which goes against the grain of me being an anti-military person, that what we needed was 20,000 troops for six months, nine months to go in there. We know what our army is capable of. We spend enough money to be able to put up the poles, build the roads, put together an airfield if we want. So we didn't do that. So he's talking again out of the empty head that he has and tweeting, I don't know why, because the, he's a maniac, uh, it, look, I just think that he is not worth listening to. He is really absent in his responsibilities as being commander in chief. So that's why I'm asking you, is FEMA on the ground uh, doing the job? They're doing as best as they can. They need more people on the ground. They should have been there. Governor Cuomo, again, I make a reference to, he was right because of his experience in HUD. They needed to be there before this. They knew what was coming. It wasn't a surprise. So they didn't know the magnitude, but it was a hurricane four or five that was coming into directly on the island. They have been negligent uh, at some point if there were, you know, who's thinking about lawsuits. But the fact is they said these are Puerto Ricans, let them drown. I'm not saying intentionally, but the actions actually have that in mind. I, I just think I'm listening to a scientist here, to a person. How many people, I asked the council member, have you had scientists come and testify? I wonder if maybe we should have scientists running pol po for politicians because I think that they would know from the outset, just out of, without going into research, I don't want to put you on the spot, I'm sure you don't want to run for office. But Brian, you've just brought up an act, I'm just listening to here, I'm sure your viewers are saying, wow, that makes sense. And yet, I haven't, have you had scientists come and testify at the we, city council? We've had professors from, from college to speak at, at my hearings. I can't say for others, but at my hearings, yes. Did your committee, it's called the Resiliency Committee? It's called the Recovery and Resiliency Committee. Did that even exist before Sandy? No, it did not. And uh, this was something that uh, myself, as well as Councilman Carlos Menchaco, represents another hard hit district in Red Hook, uh, came up with the idea of creating this new committee and to the credit of the speaker, Melissa Mark Riverito, she created this committee, uh, asked me to be the chair. And actually, every member of the committee represents an area that was hard hit by Superstorm Sandy. So it's, it, this was, an, I think, an excellent idea by the speaker. Have you uh, got any bills passed? Yes, matter of fact, we just got a big one passed yesterday that I think could be helpful to both New York and to Puerto Rico and to the U.S. Virgin Islands and elsewhere as well. Where, where, where we passed a task force bill that will create a, a panel, a ta task force of government uh, agencies uh, nonprofit uh, sector. We should have scientists uh, there as well to, rec to identify the mistakes that were made during the recovery process here in New York and make recommendations moving forward. And this could be the blueprint for both us here in New York, Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, and, and beyond. I want to connect New York and Puerto Rico in another way. Uh, I heard Mayor de Blasio say the other day that people in Puerto Rico tempted to come here should only come if they have housing he said, we'll find the seats in the public schools, other things like that. But unless you have housing, we have a terrible housing shortage. Don't come here and wind up homeless. I see your face. I'm going to limit it to seeing it was a Trumpian moment for him. Instead of saying what I'm really thinking, I don't want to be offensive. And, but, but the reality is you, you've got to think before you say things. And that was so, it wasn't only just 
just took everybody by surprise. It was hurtful. Why is it wrong? Because the, the reality is I brought family into my home. You're not going to bring people who are suffering. We're not idiots, Mayor de Blasio. We're not going to bring people here to be a burden on the city that we love also. You got to understand, we're New Yorkinos. We love the city. We're not going to do it in an irresponsible way. That in itself is an insult because he's thinking we can't even think for ourselves. We're just going to have Puerto Ricans coming here. You're not going to come to New York unless you have housing, If you, unless you have a relative. You have someone, a friend that can put you up. I know of many people that are doing it. So it, 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 was, it was just unnecessary on his part. Like, I don't know who he was appealing, yeah. which voters he was appealing to, but that was really offensive. And what does the city need to do, if it's not already doing it, to be ready to serve the Puerto Ricans who do come here because this is where their families well, are. Well, Car Carmen Farina, the, the school's chancellor, already said it. We will accommodate those students. She's making plans. That's what the mayor needed to do, be able to bring in the health commissioner. This is what we're going to do with people that come here that have medical coverage. If they don't, this is what we'll take. Offer, for example, CUNY. I'm surprised the board of CUNY hasn't even offered something that was already done. I think it was Louisiana or some yeah. other state, right, to, to be After Katrina, New Orleans came here. Exactly. Students. But Ready Puerto Ricans, I haven't, so far, I'm sorry, CUNY board members and, and, and SUNY, but the fact is, that, you know, waive the actual, because they're not going to be able to study this semester or finish it next year. So do something. I think, you know, uh, they've fallen short on certain things in the city aspect of it. I think we have too many things going on with this very contested election. <laughs> anyway, oh, uh, it's very frustrating that, that, that we should be right. acting that way. Um, so... Dr. Jacob, last word. What's going to happen if another Sandy arrives on our shores tomorrow? I think we are operationally better prepared because we probably have a better understanding in the population that if there's an evacuation order, you take it more seriously than it was done during Sandy. Physically, not that much has changed. Yes, the hospitals have moved some of their standby generators and fuel supplies to higher uh, um, stories. And Con Edison has uh, you know, made some changes to its substations and so on. But physically, in terms of where the water will go and affect residential areas, it will be pretty much the same. The subway, as I said before, may do a little bit better, but the, from a systems approach, which is an interconnected system, it's still vulnerable. So in sum, I would say it's more maybe not quite as bad as Sandy was, which took many by surprise, and now it's not so much a surprise any longer, but physically, the damage will be still severe. This has been a superstorm of smart people. Thank you very much for having this great conversation. Thank important you. conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And that's our program for today. We're here each week at this hour at the intersection of city politics and everyday life. Next time, give me shelter. We compare a cascade of different mayoral policies, all designed to solve the homelessness problem. With a record 60,000 people now in shelters, naturally we will ask how Mayor de Blasio might do better in a second term. See you midweek. Next week, I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.